Hello, everyone. Uh, as Gautam kindly introduced me, I work on sourcegraph.com. Uh, is there anyone here that actually heard about Sourcegraph or is using Sourcegraph? So in case you don't know, Sourcegraph is a code review and a code search tool. But I'm not here today to talk to you about Sourcegraph. I'm here to talk to you about programming in general. And as they say, it's, not about, it's about the journey and not the destination. So I can't not think back of where it all began. Personally, I started programming in the early 90s or late 80s, and I was using computers that ran with cassettes and floppy disks with uh, introductory languages such as BASIC and Pascal. Can anyone relate to the, that type of code? And does anyone remember like cassettes and floppy disks and all that? Those times were very linear, and you, you couldn't see, really see much indentation in code. Like, to, get, to actually feel a sense of accomplishment from programming, uh, all you had to do was be able to write a program that compiles, and if it were to do what you wanted it to do, then that was like the pinnacle of achievement. You didn't need more than that. I remember seeing this tweet by John Graham that said, when coding in the 1980s with cassettes for storage, I used to write programs and not bother saving them. Knowing they worked was good enough, and I could relate myself to that. But what about today? Does that still fly today? Today we have distributed system complex applications that talk to one another using various services. We're using multiple programming languages. There's a dozen of, dozens of people working on a project, sometimes even hundreds. So collaboration has become really important in today's world. You can't really work in isolation anymore and expect to get accomplishment from that. Obviously, you can get accomplishment from working in isolation because you learn more and you can become better. But in the end, you'll have to join everyone else be it in the open source community. So what does bring accomplishment today? Personally, I feel that accomplishment comes from having contributors to your project. If you put out a project and you see people giving you stars or forks, pull requests, or opening issues, obviously that means that your software is appreciated. But how do we do that? How do we make people contribute to our code and how do we make code that stands the test of time? So the reason I titled this talk, The Gopher from the Future, is because we want, I want us all, when we're programming, to assume the correct perspective and look through the eyes of the person that will work on our code in the future. Because it's very important that that person doesn't get frustrated with our code and is easily able to understand the code and potentially contribute to it or use it. And in order to do that, we have to assume the correct perspective. If we forget about the value of contribution, our code might work, but in the long run, it, it will probably not stand the test of time, and it will at some point get lost. So in contrast to how it was in the, in the 90s and how it is today, I think that today, two big phases of software development is you get the idea, and you use the idea to do a prototype, or what you would call a throwaway project. That means that you don't really care about contributions at this point yet, and you go out all 90s on it, you write a big blob of code, and all that matters is that the code works and it solves your problem. And doing so, you learn more about the problem, you acknowledge corner cases, and, uh, and uh, get a better idea about how to do the actual implementation. Now, in my opinion, this is where the difference between an amateur programmer and a professional programmer is. Some people don't go to step two. They just take the prototype and keep it. It already solves the problem, so what's the point to make a new implementation that is better or idiomatic, as we call it in the Go community? But if you, take, if you put in the time, on the long term, it will pay off quite well. So again, in order to do the good implementation, you have to look through the correct perspective and look through the eyes of the people that will contribute to your project or that will use it. So how do we do that? How do we write good code? In my opinion, there's one most important quality to good code, and that's readability. In, in the Go community, we, we, we could call it idiomatic. Additionally, if you write documentation or if, you're, if your uh, code is testable, then you could call yourself an expert gopher. Uh, I will briefly touch upon readability and documentation during my talk, but I won't go too much into conventions and idioms.
because those tend to err on the side of opinions and opinions change over time. I'll just touch upon what I consider to be common sense when developing. So I'll start with readability. I'd like to define readability as the quality of code that allows it to be easily comprehensible, as easily comprehensible as possible when being read by a third party. I remember I saw this tweet by Dave, which expressed it very well. When I think about the programming language optimized for readability, I think comprehension and not brevity. So what does brevity mean? Brevity means concise use of words in writing or speech, which applies when you're writing literature, for example. It's important to write the correct words so that people can read and understand what you're writing. But this doesn't apply to code. When you read code, you're trying to understand the logic of how it works, not necessarily to read, out, read it out nicely. So in order for code to be readable, it must be readable in the language of Go, not in the language of English. If we think about the previous talk, Aaron's talk, where he very wisely mentioned that people spend the most time reading code as opposed to writing code, that's when you understand the importance of readability and how important it is for your code to be understandable. Because if it's not, people will always find another project that is similar to yours and is better. So you will have to make your code readable. I remember I attended this talk in London by Andrew Garand. It was called Naming Things. I really liked it. He said, maybe this was not his exact words, but he mentioned that a good rule of thumb when naming things is that the further away an identifier is used, the more descriptive its name should be. So for example, let's say we have a for loop. Francesc mentioned this in his talk as well. Everybody in all languages uses I as the index for that for loop. There's no reason to reinvent the wheel. We can all use I, we know what I is. There's no need to call it index. Even though it becomes more brief and readable in English, it only complicates things and confuses you on for example, a code review or when reading the code. It's ideal to keep local names short, generally one letter. If you define something that is only going to be used two, two lines down, then there's no point in giving it a name longer than a letter. This is a very important point to make code readable. Don't repeat yourself. Whenever you define something, like in the example you have type header, this is from the HTTP package. It's easy to fall into the trap and think that your type is actually called header. But again, if you assume the correct perspective from the user, the type is actually called HTTP header, and the package name is part of the type's name. The same goes for a structure's methods. You can consider the structure's name part of the method, even though you can redeclare a structure and give it a variable name, which is different. But you should still consider that. Let's take this example. So these two functions are exactly the same, but which one is more readable? You would tend to think that it's the one from the upper side, because you can read it, you understand the words, you know what bytes read is, it's very nice, you understand it. But if you look closer, it takes a lot longer for you to understand the function from the upper side than the one from the lower side. The lower side actually looks like code. When I say code, I think about something that looks like that, not like that. If you look at the upper, upper side, even though it's more readable in English, it kind of obstructs the logic behind the function, doesn't it? If you look at the lower side, you can easily spot all the, uh, all the syntax and what the logic behind the function is. It takes much less, even, even when you memorize it, it takes le less mental space to remember n than it takes to remember bytes read or all the other renamings. Ideally, this is how you name things uh, idiomatically in Go. What about renaming things? I saw a lot of people do this. They think that it's a good idea to call an empty structure empty. Yes, it's true. It's, it sounds very nice. When you read out the code, it reads out nicely in English. But I'm not going to trust that what empty means. As a Go developer, I want to check what empty means. So when I see Chan empty, I have to actually search in, in the code and see what empty is declared as. So then I have to keep in mind that empty is the empty structure. Why don't we rather use the lower, lower version where we all know what the empty structure is? We're Go developers, we know what the structure is. So it's much shorter, it's more brief and easier to understand. Another topic that I really like about readability, and Aaron has touched upon this as well, 
is to have focused function, fo functions inside the package uh, or any language, or any programming language that you're writing, it's very important that functions do one thing and one thing well. If you have a long function that does many things, it would probably be better to take those things out and name them as what they do and have the big function called the small ones. It's easier to memorize. If, if you go through a long function reading all the code that you see, it takes a lot of mental space. And even if you're a very skilled developer, it will still take you some amount of effort to actually understand what's going on. Having smaller functions, you read them once, and then you recognize them by name, and you already know what they're doing. So it's much easier for everybody, and it takes less struggle. I remember my good friend William Kennedy said at Got Them Go that if it looks complicated, it's probably wrong. And it's many times true. But it's OK. Sometimes we don't have the immediate solution. It's fine to leave a more complicated function. But do keep note and maybe come back to it later. Consider it a technical debt, if you wish. Or maybe leave a note. Leave a to-do note and come back to it. The next step, if you want to make your uh, package public, is to document it. People might want to know what your package is doing, what methods this has, and they will most likely use Godot to do this. In Go, it is idiomatic that for any identifier that we document, we use the name of the identifier and we use full sentences ending with period. This is for anything that we document. Exported functions must all be documented in order for people to be able to contribute to it. You will, you will never remember this unless you keep in mind the perspective of the person that is using your code or the person from the future that will possibly contribute on your code. Unexported functions are also welcome to be documented. Let's say if, if it's not immediately obvious what a function does, and by immediately I mean immediately, as soon as you see the name, you know what it does. If it's not immediately obvious, it's very welcome to leave more comments for the contributors, even though they might not show up in GoDoc. You can read more about how to write documentations. There's other neat tricks, like for example, you can show examples of how to use a function. You can find more about that on golang.org. Again, not everything is about the external API and what the Go, what's on GoDoc. For example, this is a function from the OS package. Imagine if those comments weren't there. You would have to spend some time to actually read through it and understand the logic of what it's doing. In this case, the function is long. It, it didn't even fit on the slide. But in Go, it's acceptable because everything we do, most of the time, is followed by an extra three lines of error checking. So that's OK. But if we leave the comments, it's much easier to figure out. It, it suddenly gets divided into small pieces, and it's easy to put together. It will help uh, all of your contributors if you sprinkle some comments in line. Again, the best way to realize when you need comments is to review your own code. If you review your own code, you assume the external perspective again. And then if you notice that something is difficult to understand or is not quite correct, leave a comment. It will be easier for you in the future as well. I many times fell into this trap. I was in the shoes of the gopher from the future. I was looking at my own code from the past, and I couldn't understand it. And I was cursing at myself for the spaghetti that I've done. I was like, this is no good. Since then, I started to assume the correct perspective, and it's been working out much better for me. Run Godoc. Always run Godoc. If you don't have it installed, install it. If you run Godoc minus HTTP colon 8080, it will open a site similar to golang.org on your local host, and you'll be able to navigate to your project and see the actual documentation. Writing it in code is not enough. When you look at the code and you read your documentation, you have a different point of view because you also see the code. But if you open up Godoc and look from that perspective, I guarantee you, you will always find things missing or improvements, always, without exception. So don't, don't hesitate to do this. It is very important. So I've put together these two pieces of code, and I've intentionally blurred the code out because it's not important what it says. I'm, personally, I'm able to tell by looking at the code in five seconds which, if it's good or bad. If you guys can tell me which is the good code and why it's good, I'll give you a t-shirt, a source graph t-shirt for free, or why, the or why the bad code is bad. Which one's the good code? Is it not immediately obvious? Yeah, you can see it's divided into small pieces. 
it's nicely digestible, it has documentation, while the code on the left has a lot of indentation. By the time you reach this point, you would have probably forgotten where it started. And even if you do understand this whole function, hearing its name again won't remind you of what the function is doing. But over there, you read the function once, and the name will be specific to what the function is doing, so it will be much easier. A lot of you gave the answer, so there's enough t-shirts for everybody. <laughs> so what I want you guys to take away from this talk is that to, in order to become a good developer, you have to learn to assume the correct perspective. If you look through the eyes of your contributors and your users, you will always write good code and you will be considerate towards that. As a developer, the, the purpose is not to find the solution. The purpose is to find the right solution, and most of the cases, the simplest solution. And that's the challenge. Because a graduate developer can solve a, the same issue that a professional developer can. The difference is how they solve it and how they spend in doing that. You can read more about readability. Google has put together a document about common comments on code reviews. You can find it at that URL. It's definitely worth a read. And that's about it. <laughs> Thank you.